This video is about the Jacob Israel paradigm. As many people know, uh, Jacob and Israel are the same person. How God renamed Jacob as Israel. And there is a paradigm. Paradigm comes from the Greek word paradigma, which means a pattern. And what it means, what a paradigm means, is that when you use a familiar pattern that has happened before to predict a future event. And so uh, I've often said how the book of Genesis is like a table of contents to the Bible. And I've also explained in several previous videos how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob represent the Trinity of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, where Abraham represents the Father because he is the Father of all faiths. Isaac represents the Son because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son to God. And Jacob represents the Holy Spirit acting upon the living man in that he wrestles with God and he receives a new name. Like a, that's like a new identity. Um, so this is like the transforming power of the Holy Spirit upon a man. So the paradigm is when Jacob and Israel become one person, but he keeps switching back and forth on being called Jacob and being called Israel. Now, does this leave us a pattern of the Christian walk with God? And like when a Christian receives the Holy Spirit, they are not a perfect person and the Holy Spirit leads them through their life into becoming more and more purified, uh, such as uh, removing the dross. If you've ever seen somebody purify uh, precious metal, um, like on YouTube, you can look at somebody who is uh, purifying silver, and they mix it with a catalyst, and they melt it, and then when they pour the, the molten silver out and it cools, it's like a big black chunk attached to the block of silver that's called the dross. And that's about mm, usually like 80% of the block. And they knock that dross off and they end up with the purified silver. Now, God uses this analogy as uh, when he talks about purifying his people. He, he's refining them. So in the same way, the Holy Spirit works on a person to refine them in their lifetime. Now, this lecture here is going to be very much scripture from start to finish. There's not much about history and maps. Um, but we're going to visit... Uh, how Jacob and Israel are treated through the scriptures. So in the beginning, the very first scripture is when Jacob wrestled with the angel after he sent his family ahead of him to meet up with his brother Ezu when he was coming back from marrying his two wives and he had all his 12 children or he had 11 of them. During this time, Rachel was pregnant, and he was coming back to meet his brother who wanted to kill him when he left, and he was afraid, and he, was rest he wrestled with God that night. And I'll read it, uh, Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 24. And Jacob was left alone after he sent his family ahead, and there wrestled with a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh 
and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask for my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Peniel means the face of El, or the face of God. Okay, so he said, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. So he limped. Therefore the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. So it's like they have this custom to remember Jacob's limp. Now, what does this limp represent? This is uh, Jacob. This is him rep receiving the name Israel is representative of him receiving the Holy Spirit. And then he limps for the rest of his life after that. Or I don't know for the rest of his life, but he limps for a while. And the limp is, um, to me, it's representative of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, when, when you receive the Holy Spirit, your, uh, your life changes. But there's a wrestling match. There's a struggle inside of you to do the things of God or to do the things that your body wants. Um, is like Paul the Apostle explained, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. So there's this, this internal struggle, and I think that's what the limp represents. Now the second time, Jacob uh, was still returning, and after the events where... Uh, his daughter Dinah was raped by the Canaanite prince and the sons Simon and Levi um, tricked the people of that Canaanite city, Shechem, to get circumcised and then they slaughtered them the next morning while they were all in too much pain to fight back. Um, after that, Jacob was instructed by God to return to Bethel, where he had set up a pillar to him before, where he had named that place the house of God. So now he returns to Bethel, and this is where God uh, once again speaks with Jacob. Genesis chapter 35, starting verse 6. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is, Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, the God of the house of God. Because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called Alon Bacath. And God appeared unto Jacob again, when he came out of Padan Aram, and blessed him. And God said to him, Now Padan Aram is where he was when he was working for his two wives. It means Aram across the river. And that was where Laban, his father-in-law, lives. Okay? So God appeared to Jacob again when he came out of Padam Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. 
and he called his name Israel. So here God is reiterating what the angel said, whom God, whom, what the man said, who Jacob wrestled with in the middle of the night. And it is said that he wrestled with God. So God said to him, I am God Almighty. In the Hebrew, that was El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee I will give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. So now, uh, so God renames him Israel, and he reiterates the promises of Abraham and Isaac to Israel. Now the interesting thing that we're going to look at now is that God said to him clearly, your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, your name is Israel. But if we look at it, he continues to use the name Jacob. As we went through in previous episodes, there's the story of Joseph, how Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt. And Jacob was told that Joseph was dead and there was a famine in Canaan and Jacob sent his sons to Egypt and eventually Joseph revealed to his brothers who he was and he sent for them to bring Jacob into Egypt and uh, they, they sent chariots and a whole camel train full of goods to Jacob to bring him and his family back to Egypt. So on the way into Egypt, Jacob stopped at Beersheba. Uh, Beersheba was the place where Isaac lived most of his life. It was a place where Abraham settled near the end of his life. And um, I think because Isaac was told at Beersheba not to go into Egypt by God. It's like Abraham had overstepped a boundary, it seems, when he went to Egypt. And Isaac was told not to go to Egypt. So I think Jacob might have been a little bit concerned about whether he should actually go to Egypt or not. And he stopped at Beersheba. And he offered a sacrifice to God and inquired of God, I think, what he should, you know, to inquire of God, like, should I be doing this? Okay, so Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. So God speaks to Israel and he says, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make thee a great nation, and I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thy eyes. That means that he will die in Joseph's presence. So Joseph will see him again. So, so here it is as God is telling Jacob, don't be afraid to go into Egypt. So, so, this is the first time he talked to him since he said, your name will no longer be Jacob. Your name is Israel. And God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. 
So this is, the, again, the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. God is recognizing him as Israel, but he's speaking to Jacob. And he's saying, do not be afraid. Because Israel would not be afraid. Israel would walk in faith. Jacob is afraid. So this is the flesh and the spirit, the, the, the paradigm between the flesh and the spirit within Jacob, who is now called Israel. Okay, so now in the next video, we're going to go through the man, Jacob, Israel's life and take a look at this paradigm. But I think before we do that, I'm going to go through the entire Bible and show how this paradigm plays out through the entire Bible. So we sort of get an idea of what's, what we're looking at. From the time Jacob went into Egypt, then there's the exodus with Moses. And from that time, there seems to be no distinction made between Jacob and Israel. The children of Jacob are also called the children of Israel. And it seems to be an interchangeable thing that was just talking about the same people. And, and they also talked about Jacob and Israel. It's just interchangeable. It's the same man. So uh, here's a few examples. Genesis chapter 49 verse 2. When Jacob gathered his children together to, to give them the final blessing. Gather yourselves together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 1 Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said. So it seems to be interchangeably being used here. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 31 and Elijah, this is when Elijah had the contest on top of the mountain where he offered the sacrifice and God sent fire to take his sacrifice where the priests of Baal had failed. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be thy name. So God is almost uh, this giving a prophecy, saying, not saying Israel is your name, Israel shall be your name. You are going to be refined, and when you are refined, you are going to be Israel. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 34. Unto this day they do after the former manners, for they fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes, or after their ordinances, or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. Psalm 135 verse 4 For the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. This is up to the time of David. It's, it seems basically interchangeable. It's very hard. You might see some difference between Jacob and Israel, but it's, as far as the people of Israel are concerned, it's, it's interchangeable. After the spiritual fall of Israel happened, and the nation of Assyria was sent to take the, the northern kingdom away. 
And the nation of Babylon was sent to take the kingdom of Judah away. It was after the sin had reached such a level that this had been pretty much predetermined, which we looked at in the book of Hosea, that God was still giving them a chance to change their ways, but it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that they weren't going to. This is when he sent the major prophets. And the major prophets, particularly Isaiah, because Isaiah was a prophet during the time the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away. And he is very much known as a messianic prophet. He spoke very much about the birth and the ministry of the Messiah, Jesus. So we see in Isaiah, we start to see a difference between Jacob and Israel. So I think that this was almost like uh, was not revealed until this taking away of the flesh of Jacob and Israel was became a foregone conclusion because God's ultimate plan was the salvation of mankind so this this reaches beyond uh, the children the flesh of the flesh children of Jacob and the and it reaches to the spiritual children of Israel as we have studied in previous videos so we'll take a look here at Isaiah okay uh, there's one um, chapter in Isaiah, chapter 27, which speaks about the, uh, the controversy in all of heaven addressing sin and rebellion on earth. And it's, it's um, the metaphor being used is Leviathan. It's a two-headed serpent in the sea. And this is the slaying of Leviathan. And it's pretty complicated. I'm not going to get into it in big depth here. Um, but it's, uh, it shows a clearer distinction between Jacob and Israel. And uh, this is talking about Jesus overcoming and conquering sin. Is basically the slaying of Leviathan. Okay, Isaiah 27, verse 6. He shall cause them that come out of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. So what does this show as the difference between Jacob and Israel? Is that it's the same plant or the same tree, but Jacob is the root and Israel is is the above ground part of the tree which blossoms and buds and fills the face of the world with fruit so the, the it, Israel is rooted in Jacob so you could say well if you pull a tree out the roots is a part of the same tree so in a sense they're one and the same but the roots is, is also a different part of the tree than the rest of the tree because the roots are underground and they provide the sustenance to bring forth the fruit in the tree. So this is how we're starting to get a little bit of a difference between Jacob and Israel. Now uh, in Isaiah chapter 41, um, Isaiah is speaking here about the final restoration of Israel. So we're going to point out a few references. Uh, I'm not going to get deeply into chapter 41, but you can clearly see the, uh, the references made about Jacob and Israel. Isaiah 41 verse 8, But thou, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Isaiah 41, 14. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and you men of Israel. I will help thee, says the Lord, 
and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So Jacob is a worm, but Israel is men. So this is also showing the refining. And the worm is where the roots are underneath the ground. And the men is the above ground. Okay. Isaiah 42 verse 4. Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. So now, this almost is talking about the northern and southern kingdom. Where Israel is the northern kingdom, Jacob is the southern kingdom. Now Isaiah 43, verse 1 but now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, and I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Isaiah forty three twenty two. But that but thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. So he's, um, the reason I say that this is the northern and southern kingdom is he's talking about the two kingdoms and how they have failed and how they have turned their backs from God. And he's, he's the northern kingdom is called, was called Israel. And in some places he talks about Judah and Israel. But in this chapter, he's talking about Jacob and Israel, as if they're two different people or the same people. Um, I think he's talking about the southern and northern kingdom, but there's also a setup for a future fulfillment of the same thing. Isaiah 43, 28. Therefore, I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary I have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. Or beginning in Isaiah chapter 44, Isaiah begins to give hope to Jacob and Israel of a restoration. Isaiah 44 verse 1. Yet hear now, O Jacob my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Isaiah 44 5. <clears throat> And one shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. So, it's like different people turning to God are using different Names. Some are using Jacob, some are using Israel, and some are using God's name. That seems to be a lot like what's happening now. Different uh, parts of the Judeo-Christian religion are using different ways of expressing themselves. Isaiah 44, verse 21 to 23. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant, I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth, Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree therein, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Now, uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Up to this point, it's still kind of blurry. 
But we're starting to see some distinctions here between Jacob and Israel. Now in 48, it starts to become far more clear. In chapter 48 and 49. Isaiah 48, starting in verse 1. Hear you this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. Okay, so they're the house of Jacob, which are named Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah. So this is where I was getting that Jacob represents Judah, the, the nation of Judah, after the northern kingdom had been taken away. For they call themselves of the holy city, Jerusalem, and they stay themselves upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow is brass. That means they won't listen. And I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it to thee. Now he's going over the reasons why he kept things hidden from the ancients and revealed it much later on through Christ. And this is talking to people even now. Because if he just told it all from the start, and everybody understood it from the start. It's easy for people to say, oh, that's just a story. But he's showing his power and his um, nurturing this thing through the centuries to um, pre prevent people's ability to deny that he was actually doing this. So this is what he's talking about here. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou should say, My idol has done them, and my graven image and my molten image has commanded them. Thou has heard, see all this, and will not you declare it? I have showed thee new things from this time, even hidden things, and thou did not know them. They are created now, and not from the beginning, even before the day when thou heard them not, lest thou should say, Behold, I knew them. So, it's like I was talking about, it wasn't until it was a foregone conclusion that Israel and Judah were going to be carried away captive that the major prophets are now revealing more truth that was told from the beginning that they didn't understand uh, to prevent people from being able to deny that God has done this. Yea, thou heard not, yea, thou knew not, yea, from the time that thy ear was not opened, for I knew that thou would deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. Okay, so who's a transgressor from the womb? Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jacob. Because the name Jacob, if you remember how Jacob was born, Ezu came out first, and Jacob came out holding on to his heel. And, and, and he was named Jacob, which means usurper. Catcher from catcher of the heel, as in the sense of tripping somebody up. So that is Jacob. You were called a transgressor from the womb. Now, verse 9 For my name's sake will I defer my anger, and for my praise I will refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. 
I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, even for my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory to another. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first and the last. My hand also has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Okay, so God is showing his glory through these people. But he's saying, I can't let my name be profaned. You are going to be refined, whether you like it or not. Okay, now we're going to skip forward a little bit onto Isaiah chapter 49. And this, this is where it starts to become very clear that Israel and Jacob are not the same. Starting in verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, you people, from far. So now he's talking to the islands and the people far away. So who is that? Um, in Hebrew times, ancient Hebrew times, the islands of the Gentiles was basically talking about the Aegean Sea, which is, uh, there's thousands of islands in the sea um, near Greece that were populated by different peoples. But in later times, the prophecy, he uses that as a metaphor, but in later times it can be talking about all the nations. It's the isles of all over the world. So that's how that works. Okay, listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, you people, from far. The Lord has called me from the womb. Now this is a lot different than Jacob. Jacob was a transgressor from the womb. So who is this? The Lord has called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother has he made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand has he hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver that he hid me. And he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So right here now, there's the distinction between Jacob, who was a transgressor from the womb, called a transgressor from the womb, and Israel, who, through whom the Lord shall be glorified, who was called by God from the womb. And this, is also, this goes back to referring to Jesus Christ, the servant of the Lord. This servant person appears throughout Isaiah. So starting again in verse 4. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught or for nothing. And in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work is with my God. And now said the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. So this is like the Holy Spirit bring, refining Jacob to be Israel. Though Israel be not gathered, and yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, is it a light thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, Jesus, to him whom man despise, to him whom the nation abhors, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord, 
that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. So he's talking to Israel. And um, Jesus, when he came and walked the earth, he spoke to his disciples and he said, uh, he didn't treat them like sons, like he's God and they're his sons. He treated them like brothers, like he is the king of Israel and they are the kingdom of Israel. So they are all carrying the name Israel. This is the, uh, the gospel. It's the purified people of God are all Israel. And Jacob is the root that feeds the branches that bears the fruit. So Jacob represents the Jews or the former kingdom of Judah, which is now called Israel, by the way. And this, this heritage, with this ancient heritage, feeds the roots of the branches of the Christian nations. And they bear fruit. So it's all one, but there's different parts of it. Now there's some of this in the other prophets, um, but for the sake of time, and there's not a lot there, it's, it's pretty deep stuff, um, but Isaiah showed it the most, especially in chapter 48 and 49, where Jacob and Israel are talked about separately. Now if we look at uh, Luke, Chapter 1, it's mostly it's in the birth of Christ we will see this. Now in the New Testament, anytime Jacob is mentioned, except for this one time, anytime Jacob is mentioned, they're talking about the patriarch, Jacob. That's the only time you'll find in the Greek scriptures when Jacob is mentioned, is it's they're talking about the man Jacob, the son of Abraham, the patriarch. And Israel, when they mention Israel, they're talking about the Jews. There are there are parts in say like Revelation where Israel can be more construed as all the people of God. Um, but when Paul and the other apostles are writing their letters and when the gospels are being written when they say israel they're talking about the nation of israel or the the kingdom of judea okay where is this luke chapter 1 beginning in verse 11 and there appeared okay in this now to set up what's happening here this is when uh, Zechariah, the priest, who was the father of John the Baptist, and his wife Elizabeth was barren and, and could not bear children. And it was his turn to offer incense in the temple. So he's there. Uh, he goes into the temple to offer incense because as a priest, it's his turn to do this. So Luke chapter 1 verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But it, the angel said to him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Now that's interesting, isn't it? And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for their Lord. So here it's being prophesied that John will be born in the spirit of Elijah and he will turn many of the children of Israel 
to the Lord their God, which is Jesus. Okay, now in Luke uh, chapter 1, we go down a little bit, skip down to verse 31, and this is the part where the angel Gabriel appears to Mary to tell her about her pregnancy with Jesus. So verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So Jesus is reigning over the house of Jacob. Now, who's the house of Jacob? It is all those who believe, but who have not been purified. So, it's Christians, it's Jews, it's, it's the people who are being purified by the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus is their king. Okay, now, other than this part here, where he's talking about Jesus ruling over the house of Jacob, Jacob is never mentioned in the New Testament, except for when they mention the patriarch, Jacob. But this is the only part they talk about the house of Jacob or any other kind of Jacob. Okay, um, and there is only one, one other part where uh, Jacob is mentioned as the house of Jacob. And that is uh, in Romans chapter 11, verse 26, where the Apostle Paul is quoting Isaiah. So he's not even mentioning Jacob as anything um, other than the patriarch, but he's quoting Isaiah where Jacob is the, um, is the house of Jacob. And the quote is Romans 11, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, so he's saying, uh, the, chapter 11 is a famous chapter in Romans, saying God has not forgotten Israel. And he's talking about the Jews. And he's saying that in part they were blind that you might see and that these things might take place and that there will come a, a, a time in the future where they also shall see. And he's saying, uh, and so... All Israel shall be saved, as it is written, and this is where he quotes Isaiah, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So that's the only other part in the New Testament where Jacob is mentioned, other than just being the man, the patriarch, the Jacob. So now that quote, I guess it's fitting to read the actual quote in context, and it's from Isaiah chapter 59, starting in verse 19. <clears throat> when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of my mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, said the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So there's the, the quote, is actually verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. Okay, so that's it. Um, I've sort of gone through the entire Bible, basically, to show how Israel and Jacob are treated. And this is a, a run-up, just to, to set us up for the next video. And in the next video, 
I think I'll just read the book of Genesis from the part in Bethel uh, where Jacob was renamed Israel up to the part where he enters Egypt. And it's very interesting how it switches back and forth between Jacob and Israel. Now that we understand a little bit better about what Jacob and Israel actually represent. We'll see you in the next video.